the the hand wringing over the idea of letting out tires when we're talking about the massive death and destruction that the climate crisis is already causing, not to mention what it will cause, was mind boggling. I mean, we've reached a point where the new politics promoted by the billionaire media, in particular, the media owned by billionaires, which is the biggest threat to the living planet there's ever been. It licenses people to just invent whatever world they want to invent. I think the myths surrounding livestock and meat eating may be deeper than almost any others. We are looking at unprecedentedly large military budgets with almost no conversation about the military being the country's biggest polluter. Now, this isn't something that would be nice to have. Let's have, a, let's have a happier world. Let's have a world. Yeah, let's have a planet. Let's have a habitable planet. That's what we're talking about. I'm so excited to be joined today by George Monbiot, who is an environmental activist and author. He writes a, a weekly column for The Guardian and um, has all around been a, an inspiration to many as we face down uh, this tiger that is... Uh, feet dragging on climate activism as the clock counts down. Welcome to Bad Faith Podcast. Thank you so much. Well, it's a great pleasure to be talking to you, Brianna. Thank you. Well, part of why I wanted to talk to you is because some of the feedback I've gotten is that people are really frustrated by climate activism uh, episodes. They feel as though we're so far behind, like there's so little political traction um, that it's just too dispiriting to even discuss on some level. And the audience is increasingly more interested in having conversations about different forms of activism outside of the political context, where, again, people feel very little hope, especially in the context of our two-party system here. So I, I wonder if I could ask you just first where you are kind of emotionally uh, mm -hmm. in all of this. Obviously, we've seen some, I think, uh, environmental moments that are real wake-up call most recently, record temperatures in Europe, uh, specifically in the UK. I was there the last time they had record temperatures. I think it was 2015, and it was like a 94-degree day and everything was collapsing. So I can't imagine how it felt mm. most recently. What, what do moments like that and the continued intransigence on these climate issues make you feel? There's a sense that powerful interests almost want it to happen. Mm. I mean, I don't think they actively want it to happen, but it's as if they do, because everything they are doing could not be better calculated to accelerate this disaster. Mm. And when I say disaster, I mean, it, it, it's not on the scale of any disaster that we're familiar with or that we can see in, in history. Uh, we're talking about the greatest crisis humankind has ever faced, which is the possibility of the collapse of the habitable state of the planet. So the planet is in an equilibrium state, um, which is the result of a whole load of Earth systems basically functioning pretty well as they did during the period when human beings evolved. That's the state we've evolved for. And these systems which constitute that habitable state, they're complex systems, and complex systems don't respond in linear ways to change. They can absorb change and absorb change, and then suddenly they mm. flip. They pass a tipping point and they collapse into a completely different equilibrium state, an equilibrium state for which we did not evolve and which would basically be uninhabitable to us. And so what do I feel when I see so many powerful interests governments and the big funders who put those governments into power, the Supreme Court in the United States, um, so many business interests, so many oligarchs, pushing us towards that brink, towards that threshold. I, I, I feel terror and I feel a, an intense frustration. You know, in the past, Humankind has faced all kinds of random events for which we weren't prepared and which we couldn't predict, like massive droughts, for example, like the huge volcanic eruption in the 19th century, which basically ensured there wasn't a summer the following year, mm. um, uh, and a whole series of other such natural disasters which we couldn't see coming, but now we can see it coming. 
we know this is coming. We, we know it's, it's an inevitability unless we take the necessary action. And yet the most powerful people on earth are perversely determined not to take that necessary action. So my first response is to think of my own and to think of my two children and to wonder whether I did the right thing by having those children and bringing them into the world. Um, I'm terrified for them. You know, I've reached the age where it doesn't so much matter what happens to me, but I'm really, really frightened for them. And indeed for all the other children, for all the other young people that we've dumped this on. You know, it, it's we spend our lives as 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 adults, as parents, telling our children, you've got to clean up your own mess, you've got to take responsibility. And here we are just saying, oh, uh, all this mess, um, that's yours, you can sort that out. We're not going to do it. That, that question of responsibility is such an interesting one. I, I've heard you, you know, talk about, write about kind of the perverse em emphasis on things like, you know, using paper straws and these kind of personal behavioral changes that are a drop in the bucket when you look at the overwhelming majority of pollution being caused by a very small number of corporations. And as you often emphasize on the um, animal food industry. Mm -hmm. And I was talking recently, I was thinking about that because I was talking recently on my call-in show to someone who called in and asked about the ethics of having children in the first place and kind of emphasizing the argument that the best thing you can do in this kind of individual responsibility framework is to simply not procreate. And that, you know, for obvious reasons, got a lot of backlash, including because it does seem, again, to be an individualization of what should be a systemic critique. And I wonder what you say to people who make those kinds of arguments. Is it, is it, is it to ignore? Is it to just kind of wantonly mm. <laughs> use plastic mm. straws and discard our masks and do all the things and yeah. buy our SUVs? You know, what, what is the role in your mind to sure. those kind of, um, that focus on individual choice? Well, the first thing to say is, is that if people are choosing not to have children because of the same fears that I have about my children, that is a perfectly rational, a, a rational and reasonable um, choice to make. And I would never condemn anyone for making that choice. But when people instead say um, other people should stop having children because mm -hmm. they are the problem, that it's not just that they're individuating the problem, which they are, but they're shifting the blame directly from themselves. Because generally, what it involves is rich people in the rich nations pointing to poor people in the poor nations, because that's pretty well where all the world's population growth is. It's amongst the very poorest people, people with tiny environmental impacts. And, and seeing the rich people point to them, um, point point that finger of blame away from themselves and towards people who are effectively blameless where the environmental crisis is concerned. Uh, that, that disgusts me. And it often is a form of racism mm. It is as a way of saying the problem is not us. It's those black and brown people in other countries. They're, they're breeding too much. That's the issue. And the reality is that there was what very high population growth, but it's declined massively. In fact, it's about the only environmental indicator, which is now reaching a plateau. It's slowed to the point that it's very soon going to plateau out. And by the end of this century, it's highly likely to have declined. Um, the, mm -hmm. the actual number of people on earth is likely to have declined. And in the rich nations, it's, it's, it's declining pretty fast in, in some of those nations. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's, it's just completely mistaken to blame the issue on population when population is growing very slowly and consumption is growing very fast. That's the big driver. Now, so you might say, well, then you as a consumer need to consume less. And of course we do. And, and there are certain decisions we can make which are really meaningful decisions, like stop eating meat. I mean, that, that, that is the biggest individual choice that you can possibly make is to switch out of animal-based diets into a plant-based diet um, because the environmental impacts, not just the climate impacts, but right across the board of meat eating outweigh probably anything else that you're doing unless you're a billionaire with a private jet and, and a private yacht and, and the rest of it. Taylor Swift, we're coming which, for you. Yes, yeah, <laughs> that's right. She's been in the news recently. Yes, that's right. Um, 
Talking of which, um, uh, flying is a huge impact. So, you know, uh, if you can stop flying, please stop flying. And your transport mode as, as a whole is is really important, you know, for any journey you can make by bicycle, on foot, by public transport, That that's a big shift. But it's very hard to do that if the infrastructure is not set up for you to do that. I mean, it, it's all very well telling people they should cycle, but if they live in a place with horrendous urban sprawl, where they have to go 20 miles to go to the nearest store, well, clearly they can't cycle there. It's all very well saying to people, well, use the bus or use the train, but if there isn't a bus or a train, what can people do? And this is why all these decisions ultimately are political. They're, yeah. they're not just individual decisions. They're collective decisions which have to be made uh, politically, and, and these are choices that, that are made at that choices at the ballot box, choices between elections, choices which must be driven by active citizens demanding change. And that's the key issue. We are so, far more hmm. powerful as citizens than we are as consumers. And of course, I know with your background, you, you're, you're very well aware of all that. Well, here's here's the thing with, with my background. Even I personally have been on a kind of political journey over the last few years that I think a lot of the listeners have been on as well, where in many ways, the Bernie campaign felt to folks like the last chance at solving some of these issues, or at least meaningfully taking a bite out of some of these issues within an electoral context. 2016 was very exciting because nobody really thought, including I think Bernie Sanders himself, that it was going to go very far. And so the loss then didn't feel like quite the cataclysmic into a movement in a moment as the 2020 loss, which, mm -hmm. uh, you know, was a campaign that felt much more purposeful. And when you saw for a second time kind of the corporate establishment forces aligning in the way that they did to derail it in every way that they could, it wasn't just about Bernie. It was an indicator of how hard they will work and have been obviously working to derail the kind of sus the substantive systemic changes that are necessary in this moment, mm -hmm. which is why so many people are increasingly looking at citizen activism, including acts of civil disobedience that contravene the law. And I saw you, um, I was watching a clip of you on a panel uh, in which you were defending some protesters in one panel who had blocked traffic and in another panel, I believe, who were um, letting the air out of the tires of SUVs. And the pushback that you got in both instances was extraordinary. And I think mirrors the cultural attitudes of people in the United States who I think are actually worse on a lot of these issues when it comes to um, blocking traffic as a form of protest, strikes, any kind of traffic inconvenience. They lose their minds here and show absolutely no solidarity in a way that I experienced a little bit differently recently in France, let's say. And I, well, I yeah. so go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I was going to say it depends who's blocking the traffic. Mm. So, um, so, so if it's activists calling for action to be taken on climate, um, calling um, for um, low traffic neighbourhoods, calling basically for a better life for everyone, pursuing unselfish protests, then they absolutely hate it. This is the mm. most appalling thing you could possibly do. But if it's the Ottawa fuel blockades with with the truckers saying um, we want cheap fuel and we want a whole lot of other things but we're not quite sure what they are but they're basically involved with QAnon and Nazism then the same people say this is wonderful this is great we we, we love these people blocking the roads yeah, so here, here what, in what the UK we, yeah well I mean and 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 here in the UK we we had um, um protests against the price of fuel blocking the motorways the same newspapers which absolutely tore into the environmental campaigners who blocked the motorways were saying these are heroes yeah. So so it's just if you if you're protesting selfishly they love you. If you're protesting unselfishly they hate you. Well the framing that I've seen here even from some leftists who are friends of the show and you know whose commentary I really appreciate is that traffic protests generally as a an approach are ill advised because they are not sufficiently targeted to the source of the problem, that it tees up a conflict between workers, you know, people just trying to 
get to work. There was a, a climate protest a few weeks ago um, last month in which uh, one of the people in traffic got out of the car and said, hey, I'm a parolee, and if I don't get to work, I could be sent back to jail. And people were obviously, for obvious reasons, deeply sympathetic to this person who was stuck in traffic. But there was no conversation about who was responsible for that, whether it's our mass incarceration system that would penalize somebody for a traffic stop outside of their control and send them and incarcerate them as a consequence, whether it's the environmental policies that are being protested in the first in, in, in instance, there is no, I, you know, to make those kinds of leaps, I think would require a certain degree of solidarity and systemic understanding of what's mm-hmm. going on here. Absent that, it really does feel like uh, an, uh, an, a crabs in a barrel situation here. Mm-hmm. And I wonder how much thought you've given to how to make those kinds of cultural, political and cultural changes necessary to make those kinds of protests more effective. Or if that matters, if people should just bluster through and take the hit and take the heat and hope that over time people see these civil people exercising civil disobedience in the same way they ultimately did with history passing, with time passing, civil rights protesters, et cetera. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, they absolutely hated the civil rights protesters for doing very similar things to what the environmental protesters are doing today. And as you know, um, is well known, you know, Martin Luther King now is one of the great American heroes. But at the time, he was reviled. Mm-hmm. He and and he was hated by the media. Um, many people were whipped up to hate him. It's the same with the suffragettes in the, in the United Kingdom who campaigned for votes for women. They were absolutely detested. They were considered a menace. They were considered a danger to society. And it's partly because of the tactics they they used. And as Martin Luther King said, you know, actually our biggest opponent, our biggest problem is 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 not the, the police who are coming to beat us up. It's those white liberals who say, well, you know, we approve of your cause, but we disapprove of the way you're pursuing it. Why can't you be more gentle, more mm-hmm. quiet in the way you do it? And he knew, as we know, that if if you are gentle and quiet, you just get ignored. And and the only the only thing worse for a protester than being talked about in a nasty way is not being talked about at all. And if we are, are trying to bring these issues, I mean these existential issues, the the biggest issues humanity has ever faced, to the front and center of people's minds, they have to be talked about. And even when the media is attacking you, furiously lambasting you for blocking the roads, you nasty, cruel, horrible people, look at you blocking the roads, stopping people getting to work, they're still talking about you. They can't help talking about you. And in talking about you, they're talking about the issue. And then you push back and say, well, yeah, but look, how about the inconvenience of an uninhabitable planet? There'll be no one going to work at all on an uninhabitable planet. There'll be no individual stories of pity and sadness caused by the sort of things that we're doing because everyone will be dying. Everyone will find their lives wrecked uh, uh, to an unimaginable degree and their survival at stake. And and I, I know it's it's not perfect. It's very far from perfect. And I wish it didn't have to be this way. I wish you could just send a letter to your senator and the senator would take action. But it, that's not how it works. And frankly, it's not how it's ever worked. You know, the idea that, that you know, between elections, they're going to represent you rather than the people who funded them, the people who brung them, the people who, who paid them the money to get into power. The idea that they're going to listen to what citizens want, particularly citizens who are, are opposed to those fossil fuel interests and road transport interests and all the other interests which have paid for those people to be in power. That's just fairyland. It doesn't work like that. It it can't work like that. It never was going to work like that. And so we just have to be as noisy as we can possibly be. Well, this is what's so interesting. You know, I'm not at all surprised, obviously, by the usual suspects not being supportive of these kinds of protests. What did surprise me a little bit is the extent to which I saw some leftists being critical because there seemed to be this tension in folks' minds between 
the interests of the workers who are being in some ways disproportionately affected by these kinds of protests. And the protests themselves, the protesters themselves who are obviously are working on all of our greater interests, but there was this idea that um, certain kinds of protests divide up the coalition that you're supposed to be, you're, that you're working toward building. And, you know, I, you have written a criticism, uh, a critique of um, Marxism and, and um, anarchism. And, I, and you have written that you believe that the solution to these problems are, are going to be uh, come through a kind of a parliamentary process. Help me, help me understand what the critique is there. And does it have something to do with some of the tension that's arising within these kind of, at least in the U.S. context, left Marxist fears where sometimes I do see kind of workers' interests held up in a way that is not always obviously to me well-weighted in the balance of the broader goals, which of course inert to the benefit of workers disproportionately, poor people disproportionately when we're talking about mm -hmm. climate. Yeah. So, I mean, while I find Marx's analysis very useful, um, I have some major issues with his prescriptions, uh, particularly, you know, where he is at his most prescriptive, which is in the Communist Manifesto, um, where he creates this binary system um, uh, where into which the whole of society must eventually fall, um, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, and everybody else is to be crushed by the wheel of history, which actually is pretty well what did happen, and particularly in the Soviet Union, where all the indigenous people, all the kulaks, the peasants, the people who didn't fit into that binary system were crushed. Um, and, and then he has this, he skirts the problem of who guards the guards by sort of setting up effectively Plato's philosopher kings to determine the course that the proletariat should take. And there's just a whole series there of unthought through assumptions about how power unfolds. And we hear a consistent story amongst supporters of, of Marxist communism that what happened in the Soviet Union was a perversion. But actually, I think Lenin and Stalin were very faithful to Marx's prescriptions. In, in the Communist Manifesto. They really stuck with it to almost a frightening degree. And what we saw happening there was, was a, a kind of inevitable um, uh, unfolding of, of those ideas when they hit the real world, because the, the, the checks and balances just weren't in place. And there was nothing in, in the theory to bring in those checks and balances. Now, yeah, I'm for a completely radical transformation of society, but I, I want to see it done on di different lines. And while I believe there is a role for representative democracy, I'd, I'd like to see it as a much smaller role than there is today and a much bigger role for participatory, deliberative democracy. I'm very interested in Murray Bookchin's ideas. I'm very interested in um, some of the outcomes um, we've seen in Porto Alegre, in southern Brazil, in Reykjavik, in Iceland, in Madrid, in Barcelona, in Taiwan, um, where experiments in participatory democracy have, in, in some um, cases, gone quite a long way, particularly with the participatory budgeting in Porto Alegre. And I think what we see there is a great deal more political ownership, either than we have today, or indeed, I think, than we've uh, had um, at any time in the past two centuries um, in any um, industrialized state. Um, and and what we uh, see, particularly in Porto Alegre, particularly during the sort of golden years of 1989 to 2004 there, was pretty well total public ownership of the municipal budget. Um, and the elimination of corruption, of cronyism, of all the diseases which so many countries now suffer from, including our own, of um, the um, complete dedication of public money to public causes and massive improvements in people's living standards as a result. Uh, far lower maternal mortality, far lower infant mortality, much better sanitation, much better primary health, primary education, much better public transport, etc., etc. And Porto Alegre went from being near the bottom 
of the Human Development Index in Brazil to number one. It came out on top. And it had the extraordinary effect of people taking to the streets to demonstrate, demanding that their taxes were raised. Because they could see that when they were in charge of spending the money, they could spend it much better collectively than they could individually. So for instance, if you want to get to work on time, you could spend $2,000 on a banged up old jalopy, um, and it would still take you two hours to get to work, or you could be contributing $100 a year to um, build a public monorail system, which will take 20 minutes to get you to work. It's so much more efficient to be spending this together. But what we also see in these cases is this tremendous democratization, that when the people are in charge of the process, democracy becomes a habit. Democracy becomes something which people fight for. Democracy becomes a real and lived reality. And I think there's a parallel in the Bernie campaign, in which you were so heavily involved, where we saw the campaign built from the bottom up, uh, you know, in a really inspiring and fascinating way. Um, the way that there was that radical trust of devolved power to to the volunteers and allowing them to build build the local campaigns and 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 I think what we see there is, is a sort of mirror of how participatory democracy can work and could work and maybe would have worked if if, if Bernie had become president and so it, it's his 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 politics I'm very keen on you know and I was very keen on Jeremy Corbyn's politics here and he was thwarted by very similar forces mm. um, but I, I think we have to be real about how political power is transmitted from the people rather than to the people. And that's the key missing element in so many systems. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I do think that so many folks in the context of the Bernie campaign and more broadly are very enthusiastic about the emphasis on worker ownership. Many people, and we've had episodes on um, uh, uh, nationalization of various industries and whether that's something that should be a more robust part of the conversation. Um, but I think many folks who do identify as Marxist would push back against the idea that there's this association between kind of authoritarianism and Marxism, as opposed to the democratization and the public ownership that you're emphasizing here. And I think they would largely agree with you on those points without necessarily seeing them as intention with Marxism. But regardless, the Bernie example is interesting to me because the fact of the matter is that Bernie and Corbyn were both derailed mm. by some people's, in some people's view, in part because they chose to rely on a system that was never going to let them succeed and was designed to thwart them from succeeding. And there is you know, people, some people believe there is a certain naivete to believing that if we just give it another shot, if we wait for another one of these once in a generation of candidates to come along, if we just if we just tweak the message, if we just, you know, some people argue, oh, Bernie talked too much about identity politics this time, this time around or whatever, whatever people's arguments are, that it could work. But folks who have a different theory of change, many people who identify themselves as Marxists believe that ultimately the real solution is going to come from this bottom of power, that it's not going to come, while it would be much better for us to have a parliamentary system and multi, multiple parties in the United States, it would be easier to break through if we had those things and that we should fight for those things. Ultimately, especially because we're in, uh, at the scale of the climate crisis, it's going to take something that's much more disruptive, frankly, um, which is why there's such an appetite for groups like Extinction Rebellion and others who are very open about their willingness to kind of take actions that are starting to approximate the scale of the issue. Mm -hmm. um, and part of why I'm so interested to talk to you is because you have not backed away when pressed on those kinds of actions from saying that they're justified. Even when I would argue the actions are so like minuscule in nature, like the, the 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 hand wringing over the idea of letting out tires when we're talking about the massive death and destruction that the climate crisis is already causing, not to mention what it will cause, was mind boggling. Is this justifiable, Ed? Um, well, no, I don't think it is. I mean, I think uh, people gluing themselves to the road 
and deciding that they are going to be our spokesman on climate change and therefore have permission to interfere and uh, mess up our lives in any way they see fit is unacceptable. Yeah, but if you guys were doing that job, d doing your job, none of this would be necessary. Well, vote for somebody we, else here then. We Don't are. let down people's yeah. tires. So here he we does. are in the midst... Yeah, I do, actually. Well, here ahead. we are in the midst <laughs> of a climate emergency. Oh, come on, you guys. George. What, you're saying it's not a climate emergency? Of course emergency? there's a climate emergency. Are you, but you are you saying that's justified? You're saying that no, no, no. You're just, uh, just spouting the word climate emergency doesn't give you permission to vandalise people's cars no, 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 yeah, or glue you, yourself to the you pavement. You haven't even let me finish my sentence. I know, that's because, because you're We're talking mid, nonsense. We, uh, you don't even know what I'm talking because I haven't said it yet. <laughs> well, get say it, In quick. the midst of a climate emergency, <laughs> you guys are messing about, dragging us all into this ridiculous drama in Downing Street and not doing the job which needs to be done. So, what do we see? We look around us and see, oh my God, these people are trashing our life support systems with their SUVs and lots of other profoundly antisocial habits. So, yeah, I'm in favour of it because I think, actually, if you guys aren't going to regulate it, who's going to step You're in You're in favour of tyre letting activity. down. Just yeah, to be yeah, clear, yeah. you literally are. I am are. literally wow. in favour. Wow, wow. Yeah, that might I'm let in favour. <laughs> You've let me down. You let the whole school down. Oh, no, right. Well, hang on. I'm, I'm in favour of much cheaper electric cars. I'd love an electric yeah. car. That but not letting people's tires down. I've and already so had the front of my car taken off by vandals. The VW sign. So, you know. Justifiable or not? I think it's criminal damage, but I think there is a place for uh, protest that disrupts lives. Oh. Um, and Including I, letting down people's no, that's no, no, I said no, that, you said that's, that's criminal, criminal damage, damage. yeah. Mm. Um, because I think you have to target your message to people who are going to be able to do something about it. And actually, the SUV drivers or owners of, of those cars are probably not the people who are oh. going to be making the legislation. OK, let, let's get some perspective here. Um, <laughs> SUVs, not only... Full not only are, are massively more damaging in terms of yeah. pollution yeah. and in terms of climate breakdown, shortening the lives of very many people, they're also far more dangerous um, for pedestrians and cyclists because they're so big and heavy. If you get hit by one, you're more likely to be killed. I, I'm not advocating contrast, no, SUVs. Okay, okay, okay but, but right, I agree with you about SUVs. By contrast to the extraordinary imposition they are making on us, letting down a few tyres is actually a very small imposition what? on them. A hundred, actually, George, this morning. I think you should withdraw your support for letting down tyres. Yes. I think that's really irresponsible for you to sit here on TV and say it's OK for people to take that type of direct I action. It's okay. Wow. It's okay. All right, well, wow. he's not, well, wow, well, but he's not going to retract it. House. It's mind-boggling. The woman was acting like you were talking about killing babies when we're not, we're not even talking about destructing, like hurting cars in a permanent way. It's literally mm -hmm. just letting the air out of the tires. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it, and, and to me, I, I bring up that example because it does feel like there's an, a huge kind of cultural shift that is required to get the majority of people to, to be in that revolutionary moment that I think many folks on the left believe is required. Especially in the United States where, I mean, you're talking and we should talk more about um, divesting from meat eating. But in the United States, Democrats who don't even back any of these climate policies or aren't even doing anything to subsidize vegetables or stop subsidizing some of the um, more um, harmful farming practices are accused of trying to end the 4th of July and canceling hamburgers. I mean, the the, the cultural salience of some of these food products in the United States in particular in particular makes it seem almost impossible for everyone to anyone to ever hint at the idea that you would take aim at these industries. So, well, I mean, what do, what do you make? You, you've talked very, I think, persuasively about our investment in these products like cheese and, you know, what they really are and how we can reframe these kinds of ideas. And I wonder if you might might do a little bit of that now. Sure, sure. Thank you. Well, uh, so uh, there's all sorts of places we don't want to go because of these deep myths that surround many of our habits. And I think the myths surrounding livestock and meat eating may be deeper than almost any others. We, we're we very heavily invested in them, whether it's the cowboy myths of the Wild West, which was like white America's Arcadia, this supposedly endless frontier rolling towards the Pacific, and we just brush all the indigenous people out of the way, and we've got this paradise for ourselves, and these these uh, wild, raw people driving their cattle across the plains. And of course, however many times you can point out, well, it wasn't really like that, it doesn't matter, because that myth is, is super dominant. And the same in Europe um, with our 
pastoral poetry, our pastoral dramas, which go all the way back to the poet Theocritus in the third century BC. Virgil follows on from him. Um, the idea that um, uh, harmony and innocence is found in the shepherds with their flocks sitting under the trees and and telling stories and playing music. Um, it, it's similar in the Old Testament, where it was largely written by the settled descendants of previously nomadic herding people who look back with nostalgia at their forebears of Abraham with his um, flocks darkening the plains at Abel, the, the herder of beasts who was killed by Cain, the tiller of the ground, and they lambast the city. Woe to the bloody city! It is all lies and robbery, the prey departeth not. And then Jesus comes along, who's both the good shepherd and Agnes Dei, the Lamb of God, and he tells his disciples, feed my sheep. And his disciples become the first pastors, which is Latin for shepherd, but mm. of course also means priest. And um, and and then these two traditions come together big time in the Renaissance um, through Dante and Petrarch and Boccaccio, and in England Marlowe, Spencer, Herbert, Shakespeare, people like this, um, and form this very very powerful deep myth, what um, the great cognitive historian Jeremy Lent calls a root metaphor, which which helps to define our lives in ways which are so deep that we don't even see it as a thought pattern. It's just the way things are. And so when someone challenges the livestock industry, even though the livestock industry is unrecognisable from, from what it was previously, and is arguably the most destructive industry on earth because of its enormous devastation of, of habitats, um, the extinction it drives, the pollution of rivers and seas, the um, tremendous amount of greenhouse gases it produces, um, and so many other impacts. When someone challenges that, it's like they're challenging you. Mm. It's like your identity is being attacked, even if you're not a farmer, but you just belong to the culture, belong to the society. It's like, I'm coming for you. That's how, how they feel. And this is why I get these really vituperative responses and all the death threats, you know, when I start talking about, um, you know, we've got to bring animal farming to an end. Uh, that's when the death threats really come. I mean, I've had more from that than at any time since the Iraq war. When I opposed the Iraq war, you know, it was a daily basis and now it's back to daily death threats. So they don't bother me, you know, most of the people making these threats live in the Midwest and don't have passports. But you know, it's, um, it's still, you know, it, it's interesting to, to see what, why this is coming, what, what's happening here. And, and yet, you know, if we're serious about protecting life on Earth, about defending the habitable planet, about having a planet, having lives actually being here till the end of this century and beyond, we have to deal with this just as we have to deal with the fossil fuel industry. Uh, 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 ending meat eating is as important as leaving fossil fuels in the ground. They're, they're of equal importance. And now we have a much better means of doing so because this amazing technology called precision fermentation has come along. And precision fermentation is basically a refined form of brewing, um, which um, instead of um, uh, getting our protein-rich um, uh, food from the flesh of animals and the secretions of animals, which we currently do, instead gets it from microbes. So it doesn't have the cruelty, it doesn't have anything of the environmental destruction um, caused by the livestock industry. It's a tiny land footprint, tiny water footprint, tiny amount of nutrients, and produces this very protein-rich flour, which you can basically turn into anything. Mm. And so you've got the means now very cheaply, very easily, much more easily than from plants, to make substitutes for the animal products we eat, but also to develop a whole new cuisine, an entirely new diet that we can't even conceive of any more than the first Neolithic farmers to catch a wild cow were thinking about camembert. Yeah, and, and so we, I think we're on the verge of something very exciting here. But what I see is a lot of pushback against it, including from some environmentalists. Is, oh, I don't want to eat bacteria. And I say, oh, hang on a moment. You eat bacteria with every meal. Your food is full of them. In fact, a lot of the food we eat deliberately contains live bacteria, like cheese. You know, you think about, you know, if you, you say yuck with this dead back, uh, this flour made from, from, from dead bacteria, you say yuck. Okay, let, let's think about cheese for a moment, right? Cheese is, is made from the mammary secretions of, 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 
of, of, of cows, right? Mixed with, traditionally, a chemical taken from the fourth stomach of a nursing calf, which, when it's mixed with those mammary secretions, forms this wobbly mass of protein and fat, into which you then inject bacteria, which digest that wobbly mass, and their excrements then go hard and yellow and start to smell, and then you eat the hat. <laughs> and, and you're saying precision fermentation is disgusting? I mean, come on. Oh, so as someone who doesn't find the idea of precision fermentation disgusting at all, I'm curious, just realistically speaking, how far along that technology is and how close we are to it kind of yielding uh, the diversity of food items and options that could reasonably be pitched to folks as an alternative. Because I, I hear you saying that we will develop different cultural practices around new foods in the same way that the first person to milk a cow wasn't thinking about camembert. But that also took hundreds and thousands of years of, you know, food and cultural evolution. And, you know, asking people to do a hard reset, I think would be easier, obviously, the farther along we were toward this new culinary trajectory. So I'm curious, you know, where where are we in that process? Sure. So, so first of all, let's say, actually, we've been doing hard resets big time with food. I mean, if you take the UK, for instance, we were indifferent to food in this country until about 30 years ago. Now we are Quite obsessed. Quite famously with, so. <laughs> yes, exactly. Now we're obsessed with food. Absolutely. There's this little gastro porn everywhere. You know, it's like every, open any magazine and it's all these sort of luscious pictures of food and people are just food crazy. We've gone, gone completely food mad in this country. And that's an amazing turnaround in a remarkably short amount of time. Worldwide, we've switched from sort of very um, a distinct local cuisines into a sort of global standard diet, um, which um, in some ways is is worse, in some ways is better. Um, depends where you are, where you stand. But generally, our diets have become much more diverse locally, but less diverse globally. So we're all eating sort of similar kinds of, well, not all of us, but large numbers of the world's people are eating similar kinds of products. Um, how close is precision fermentation? Well, um, uh, the the company that I went to visit in Helsinki, Finland, um, has now applied for um, a regulatory license um, uh, in the European Commission. So in order to sell its uh, products across Europe, it has to do that. Um, and it's uh, pretty close to uh, getting below the cheapest form of protein currently now produced, which is from soy. And so you get below that threshold and you, you and you get the regulatory approval, which they're seeking at the moment. And it's very hard to see what can stop them because suddenly it's like, well, this becomes your building block. This becomes a lot cheaper and it's got these cost curves, which should be pretty similar to digital cost curves because it's modular production. You know, with livestock, you've really hit the cost barriers, which is why livestock is treated so cruelly now, packed in the, these enormous factories packed into these massive feedlots, have these miserable lives, slaughtered when they're very young, force-fed with, well, not force-fed, but, you know, packed with food at a great rate. Um, and, and and that's because they're pretty well hit the limits of how far you can push a multicellular organism, like a chicken or, 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 or a hog or, or a cow. Um, and you can't push them much further. But when you're dealing with single-celled organisms, you know, you, you, you're much closer to a sort of digital type of industry, and mm -hmm. it's likely to have these much steeper cost curves. So um, when it takes off, and I think it's very close to doing so, it could take off very fast. And, and you know, cost will be the major driver, but then there's all sorts of other reasons why we might want to switch to it. Well, George, what does it taste like? So, yeah, I was the first person outside the laboratory to eat a pancake made of this bacterial flour. And, and so basically you see this stuff sort of swirling around in the vats, but then it comes out, they put it through a dryer and you get this, it's a golden colored flour and it looks just like flour, except it's, it's, it's sort of golden yellow and that's because it's got some beta carotene in. But that flour is about 60% protein and about 30% fat. Now, human beings are very attracted to protein. You know, we've got a real sort of drive to eat protein. And so just the smell of it straight away is, like, ooh, that smells good because it's basically the smell of 
almost pure protein, you know, 60% mm. protein. So it smells a bit like eggs, a bit meaty. Mm. You just ooh, you just want to eat it. And and I asked them to make me a pancake. So they'd be the first person outside the lab to eat a pancake made from this stuff. And um, and normally when, when you make a, a sort of Western-style pancake, you start off with your wheat flour, and then you have to raise the protein and fat content in order to make it that nice pancake. Um, so you add your eggs and your milk. But in this case, if we just use the flour, we would have made an omelette because there's so much protein in it. So you had to had to dilute it with wheat flour to bring it down to to, to the right sort of level. You need to bring in about sort of 50, 60 percent wheat flour to get it right. And and then they cooked it and it smelt amazingly like a pancake. And I thought, oh, what's this going to be like? And, I, and it tasted just like a pancake. It was so weird. It was that uh, uncanny, and and I thought, oh well, this is a small flip for man. <laughs> um, but uh, but obviously they're not just in the business of making pancakes. You know, this was just a sort of demonstration. But you can you can make almost anything with it, which is rich in protein and fat, and and so it makes meat substitutes so much easier. I mean. The trouble with making um, sort of veggie burgers and things out of out of soy or something is you have to extract the protein from the soy and you have quite a lot of processing and then it doesn't taste right and so you have to bring in all these other ingredients. You end up with this long ingredient list. It's not a great product, but with this, you basically got pretty well your ingredient right there, and you have to add very little to to turn it into something which is going to taste really good. And it's the idea that this is. You know, supplementary, because even in the example you give, you talk about needing to mix it with flour. You know, it's the, it's the idea that this is a substitute for, say, most of the chicken, beef, et cetera, that we eat, even eggs, uh, in addition to, uh, you know, emphasizing and subsidizing vegetable farming, you know, mm. traditional agriculture, as opposed to all of the large animal feed operations mm. that take up so much land and are such an inefficient use yeah. of resources and consume so much of the agricultural pro produce that we currently make. Yeah. So, so I, I've really divided food. Uh, so all, all this is the work I've done for this um, book I've written called Regenesis. And, and what I've done is to try to work out how we can feed the world without devouring the planet. And in doing so, I've, I've divided food into three categories. Uh, one is protein and fat, um, which precision fermentation and the associated technologies, I think, can deal with very effectively with a really tiny environmental impact. I think they are the most important environmental technologies on Earth today now, because if if they do substitute for our protein-rich foods, and I don't just mean animal products, but also soy, palm oil, coconut oil, um, uh, you know, uh, and other products like that, which are also quite damaging. They're not as damaging as animal products, but they're still pretty damaging. Then suddenly there are huge areas of the world's surface which can be used for ecological restoration, for rewilding, for bringing back wild forests and wetlands and savannas and natural grasslands, which can not only stop the sixth great extinction in its tracks, but also draw down a great deal of the carbon dioxide we've already released into the atmosphere. Because thanks to all those people as we were talking about at the beginning of this discussion, we've now left it too late um, merely to decarbonize our economies. Now, if we want to stop the collapse of the habitable planet, uh, we also have to draw down a lot of the carbon we've already released into the atmosphere. And by far the easiest, cheapest and most benign way of doing that is restoring ecosystems because as the trees grow, as the wetlands develop, they draw down carbon dioxide and turn it into solid carbon. On, on and you do that on a very large scale, and that's quite a lot of the problem solved. We also have to decarbonize our economies as quickly as possible. It's not a substitute, but as a supplement, it could make the difference, which will determine whether or not we get through this century. I mean, really, that's, that's how important it is. That's that's the thing. I mean, this is this is, I think. Part of why people are frustrated by sometimes uh, envi uh, environment episodes because totally everyone agrees. But then we look at what's happening right now, for example, in the United States, where there is this proposed energy and climate bill that 
is a small, small fraction of the already insufficient climate investments that were proposed initially in Build Back Better. Mm. And yet still is rightly described as potentially the largest climate investment that has ever been done in the United States. Mm. And so at the same time that we are being told to really celebrate this accomplishment, which again is pennies on the dollar of an already insufficient program, we are looking at unprecedentedly large military budgets with almost no conversation about the military being the country's biggest polluter. And the idea that our government, either of our two parties, is going to meaningfully do something, you know, to take up any of these um, initiatives that you're describing. I'm having a hard time even imagining them being especially invested in, uh, you know, these protein-rich food alternatives yeah. for just the cultural reason, reasons and the political mm -hmm. hit that will come from, oh, Biden is trying to replace your hamburger with a bug. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. I mean, there is something so screwed up about the whole discussion now. I mean, it, it does make it makes any sensible, rational discourse almost impossible. I mean, we reached a point where the new politics promoted by the, the 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 billionaire media in particular, the media owned by billionaires, which is the biggest threat to the living planet there's ever been, um, licenses unreason. It licenses people to just invent whatever world they want to invent without having to debate it, without having to discuss it, without having to sift fact from fiction, without having to use reason at all. And you know, reason is for soy boys. Reason is for for those intellectuals, that elite that we hate, mm. um, and and they've been licensed to just throw all reason and all facts and all debate to the wind, and just say, right, all we need to do is to assert and to threaten and to attack, and it's kind of true that is all they need to do now, and there's almost no challenge to it. You know, and obviously the extreme example is, you know, the, the capital attacks, but actually that's just, you know, that's the tip of the iceberg of a culture which has been radically changed by deliberate political lobbying to effectively destroy meaningful political deliberation. Yeah, I mean, it, it's difficult too, because I don't want to sound like this is a, a partisan thing or one of these kind of uh, elites versus not or coastal versus interior culture wars. I mean, you have Kentucky underwater currently as we speak in California on fire currently as we speak. I've heard uh, environmentalists explain how much traction they've gotten making, you know, Green New Deal just transition arguments in places like uh, Gulf, the Gulf states where they've been able to pitch to people who have made their livelihood for generation on various kinds of, you know, fishing or, you know, crabbing or taking harvest from the ocean, relying on on estuaries and these kind of delicate ecosystems who are invested in environmental reform because of their inability to continue their, their trade and how there are different kind of pitches that really are effective to people. Um, people who are having to rebuild their homes over and over again because of persistent flooding and all of these kinds of things. There is a pitch to be made. I'm almost not even... It's, my concern isn't that it is such it's an insurmountable cultural shift. It is that the people who control the mainstream media and avenues of discourse are so opposed to having those conversations and are also so effective at reorienting people who are being directly impacted mm -hmm. by climate change to prioritize other things, you yeah. know, whether that's being they're being whipped up about some trans fervor is the thing that apparently is everyone's number one voting issue in the United States of America for reasons. Um, or any of these other cultural issues where people capitalize on hatred and difference in the way that they've done since time immemorial. I wonder if you've had any kinds of successes in communicating to people who are not traditionally perceived to be sympathetic for political or other kinds of reasons to a, an emphasis on on addressing climate change? 
there are moments. There are moments when you break through, particularly moments of climate disaster, but then they're swept away again. And, you know, it is it is these men like Charles Koch and Rupert Murdoch, these other billionaires with tr who translate their economic power into political power, who turn real political and economic and environmental issues into culture wars. And they are fighting a culture war. They're fighting a culture war against all of us, but they've managed to persuade some people to fight on their side. I mean, they are the enemies of humanity. They're, they're, the, they're the enemies of life on Earth. Um, and they are determined to pursue their own immensely selfish interests uh, to the ends of the Earth. I mean, they literally would sacrifice the whole planet not to give an inch of their power not to give uh, make a single concession um and and so somehow we have to prize people away from that evil influence we have to 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 bring people back and i think the only way we're going to do that is by showing a better world is is by showing that actually we can have a world where people really can take back control where they're not going to be pushed around and um, but, you know, where we're going to make decisions in a far more egalitarian and collective way. And that's where I come back to participatory democracy as being so important, absolutely critical. And the fascinating thing about it is that it works much better in practice than it does in theory. You, you, you can come up with all these theoretical reasons why it's not going to work. Oh, people would never do this. People would never do that. But as soon as people are given a taste of real power, of really being able to sit down with everyone in their communities and decide for themselves how that community is going to work and what they're going to do and what decisions they're going to take, suddenly the selfishness drops away. It's so fascinating to see this in action. And, and it's like, oh, this democracy thing, yeah, it's real. You know, this is what it feels like. And democracy then becomes a habit. It becomes a, a lived reality for people. And and if we still, you know, if, if we just stick with this system where we say, right, you know, well, you can vote for your crazy, crazy guy at the next election and we'll vote for our crazy guy at the next election and whoever wins has total power for the next four years and, and none of us will have a say in that time, then of course we're going to fight like rats in a sack. Of course we are, because we're all deprived of power and then we turn on each other. I mean, the system is insane. You, you you have this situation where where they say right you vote for me once and then i have a mandate to do whatever i want as long as i got enough of a majority for my own party um during the next 4 years whether or not it was on my platform you know whether or not i just plucked this idea out of the air i have a mandate and if you challenge that mandate they say well well you know by by allowing me to win the election you have consented to whatever i do for 4 years and we don't accept the principle of presumed consent in sex. Mm. Why should we can accept it in politics? But because we live under a system of presumed consent, in other words, of no consent at all, a system of of of, of uh, 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 oppression and and insistence and domination on on the part of these people who claim to represent us, because we can't fight them, we turn on each other. And the culture wars are the product of us having no real power over our own lives. And what we see in these cases, and you know, I know these cases are few and far between because power very seldom allows people to get, to get a handle on it. But what we see in these rare cases is that when people do get a taste of that, of genuine shared grassroots ownership of politics, then it's utterly transformed. Those culture wars just fall away. And people are saying, okay, we've got this problem. We as a community got this problem. How the hell are we going to solve it? And they'll sit down and they'll work out practical ways which meet each other's needs as well as their own needs. And, and the selfishness goes and it becomes a collective effort. And, and it's like it has to be a practice before it becomes a theory. You know, and, and frankly, mm. I mean, you know, we started off with a discussion about Marxism. I mean, I'm not committed massively for or against it. You know, it's not a big deal for me because actually political theory is kind of irrelevant if you've got the practice. If you're doing it, then you can say, okay, we've proved it in practice. How does this work in theory? It's less important than actually living it and actually doing it. Yeah, I mean, I, I cannot disagree with that. 
as you're talking, I'm considering examples that prove your point and then counter examples. I think of the ways that school boards, you know, one of the places where people are disproportionately, I would argue, engaged to the extent that people are doing participatory, participatory democracy and how there are these viral moments of parents being very galvanized in the culture wars over, you know, trans kids being mm-hmm. allowed to play on the team of their preferred identity or their, you know, books being banned because they mm-hmm. talk about mm-hmm. slavery or, you know, they accuse yeah. them of being yeah. CRT, which of course is somehow yeah. worse know. than book burning <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and all of this stuff. And of course, I don't mean to be overly pessimistic and I don't, I don't want to say things that discourage people from doing anything at all. I think, of course, you're right. And the goal has to be to kind of take back some of these public spaces and figure out how to communicate in ways that reorient, reorient people's mm. political priorities. But it does strike me as an, up, an uphill battle. And I do understand why people feel a lot more, especially given the exigency of the climate crisis, a lot more heartened by the idea of just chaining themselves to something or yeah. lying in the middle of a street. Sure. No, uh, and, and it's not either or, but can I just say about the school boards that I think yeah. you know, that's, that's, that's what happens when people don't have power. You know, when the only forum mm-hmm. where they can feel their voices are heard is on the school board, you know, they'll bring in all the issues which aren't being heard elsewhere. And they'll use that as their battleground because they are powerless, because they've been deprived of power everywhere else. There's this one place and then we're going to load all this stuff onto this place, which isn't the right forum because it can't handle those issues. You know, the, 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 it's, it's not the right place to be doing it. In fact, it's the most inappropriate place you could possibly imagine to fight all, all these battles. And these battles themselves have been invented by the system that keeps us powerless. They've been invented by powerful people to stop us talking about the real issues like inequality, the concentration of wealth, the destruction of the living planet. You know, culture wars, the, the purpose of culture wars is to stop people talking about inequality. That is that is the primary purpose of them. Yeah. And, 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 and it's very effective. And when we live in a system which is so unequal politically as well as economically, where some people have, are super dominant and other people have no power whatsoever, then in the very few forums where your voice can be heard, even if those forums are basically, you know, they're not going to answer any of your fundamental complaints, people just explode and 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 go crazy. But you know, that that's not that's not what I'm talking about with participatory democracy. I'm talking about real power running all the way through society, running through every single issue we need to engage with, where we we take control of public budgets, we take control of public decision making. Um, on on every possible level you can. And of course, there's some issues which are global in scope, you know, and, and we I think we also need to have international climate treaties, for example. You can't just deal with it locally because what do you do about the free riders? But unless you're building it from the grassroots at the same time, you're never going to get the traction, even in international negotiations, because there's going to be no real pressure on politicians. Well, that's that's so, the thing. There was this moment in one of your interviews where, you know, one of the other interlocutors was criticizing the protesters for not participating in the cop conference that was happening up the road. And, you know, there was like, well, if you want to do something, go join that. But there's this, the, the obvious pushback is that some of the major players in the world, like the United States, refuse to make the kind of commitments that are necessary to get to the goals that everyone likes to announce as perspective and ideal at these conferences and then not commit to, we just keep pushing the, 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 the the dates back and back and back. Yeah. And, and so we, I mean, again, it's this farce, it's, it's this pretense of action whose sole purpose is to prevent action from being taken. I mean, that, that's what these, these, um, COP conferences are all about. It's mm. it's it's so they can strut and fret upon the stage um, without actually doing what needs to be done. Um, and and the last one in Glasgow, which I went to, was it was such a contrast. It was very depressing because on the state on the streets that was where the energy was. 
Mm. Um, and there were people from all over the world had converged to try to put pressure on, on these governments. And it was led by the global south, by people from poorer nations. And that was a real change, you know, because previously it had been voices from the rich nations, voices like mine, which had dominated. But now there was a real sense that things had tipped and it was the global south voices which were coming to the fore. And that was a tremendously exciting moment. Mm. And there was a real sense of energy and determination. And then you step into the conference center and it's like passing through an airlock into a space station. It was this weird, detached white place it was all everything was white and 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 it and it sort of had a sort of feeling it was a bit like that dome in um what's that um um jim carrey um oh, movie um, where the truman show the truman show that's yeah. right it's like you stepped into that dome where everything everything is fake mm. everything is fake and 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 you still had some amazing people in there and they were were representatives of of the states which are being hit hardest already by climate breakdown. So the small islands and places like Bangladesh, some of the African nations being being hit massively by drought already. And they were amazing. And, and they were saying all the right things and they spoke with great passion, but they were completely sidelined and ignored. And all the real business was just done between six or seven powerful nations, which stitched things up between them and ensured that nothing real happened. And so you had the real world outside where people were full of passion and energy and determination. And inside it was just like dead. There was this sort of just yeah. sense that the very air you breathed in there sent you into a stupor um, from which you couldn't emerge. Yeah. I mean, look, maybe I should ask you in with this question about the Global South. I'm sure that you've seen there's a recent story about how political attitudes in the global south about the impending food shortages caused by the conflict in Ukraine and Russia's invasion are not being perceived as they are framed in the in the global north as, you know, you know, Russia's bad, but we got to keep doing this forever. The fault is on Russia, but many in the global south are seeing this as a kind of generalized, you know, Europe's problem that's affecting us, and they're big mm. mad. They're yeah, they're upset yeah. about it, and they're not willing to kind of buy into this kind of we got to do this for patriotism reasons. Spin. It's not that they're unsympathetic to what Ukrainians are going through, but they are tired of the cost of these kinds of conflicts having to be borne by them. And I I wonder what you make of that like that fundamental tension mm. where. Of course, it's always been the case that the, the disproportionate harms of global warming, et cetera, are, are being heaped on the global south. But now it does seem to be the fact that because of this kind of realignment that's happening, the growing power of China, the, the solidifying China-Russia dynamic that's happening now as Russia's you know, trying to avoid sanctions, et cetera, over this conflict, whether or not there is a, a weird opportunity for the global South mm. to have more of a say because of a kind of political balkan balkanization, a kind of um, the multipolar world that is emerging. Yes. I mean, I, I'm not convinced that this world is going to be any better than the last version of imperialism. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I just think it's going to be a different set of imperial powers. Um, you know, that's what imperialism does. It just um, extracts and exploits uh, poorer nations and poorer peoples and anyone who isn't as well armed as imperialism is. However, people in the global south are absolutely right to say, you know, this isn't, <laughs> this shouldn't be just about Europe and shouldn't be just about Ukraine. I mean, what, what Russia's invasion of Ukraine did was not create the global cr food crisis so much as reveal the global food crisis, because that crisis has been there for years. I mean, since 2015, the number of chronically hungry people has been rising, even while the, f the world has been awash with food. And there are some very major and extremely alarming structural deficiencies in the global food system. In fact, in some respects, it looks like the global financial system in the approach to 2008. A small number of companies, each of which has become too big to fail, dominating the system. There are four um, uh, global corporations which dominate 90%, uh, which control 90% of the global grain trade, four corporations. Mm -hmm. um, the um, Much of that trade is now passed through a series of pinch points, such as the Turkish Straits now effectively closed. 
the Suez Canal, which was closed last year because of that ship wedged across it. If those two th- events had coincided, by the way, the food chain would just have snapped. And and hundreds of millions of people would instantly have, have gone hungry because the food could not have arrived. It, it it's it it's a very, very fragile system now, and it has been for a long time. And Ukraine has made things worse. I mean the invasion of Ukraine, but um it, it, it did not invent the problem. That's not you know, and, and so we see these highly impoverished countries at the end of this global food chain, totally dependent on imports, many of them, they've become super importers. Almost all their food has to be imported because they don't have the fertile land or the water to to to, to grow the food that they need. They're having to buy this food with soft currencies and a hard currency market. This market itself is becoming extremely fragile. Shocks are being transmitted through it much more disastrously than than in the past because of the way the whole thing is now integrated and integrated and 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 um and 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 it's lost its diversity it's lost its its resilience um and yeah it's all looking very 2008 and and i i know you know you might i might sound a bit obsessive about this but that's another thing that precision fermentation can do because it's basically brewing it's brewing and all you need um, for it is hydrogen because um, certainly the outfit I was uh, I visited in Helsinki um, is using hydrogen oxygenating bacteria. So the, the bacteria eat hydrogen. That's the feedstock. Hydrogen can produce be produced anywhere with a lot of sun, and and most of the world's hungry countries have a great deal of sunlight, and so they could completely detach themselves from the need to import protein-rich and fat-rich foods from anywhere else and produce their own locally. And and that's why we got to fight intellectual property rights. We've got to fight big corporations. This is a gift to the world, this this technology, and it must not fall into corporate hands because if it is available to poorer nations um, and, and to small businesses within those poorer nations so that each town could have its own brewery producing these protein-rich foods, that could suddenly remove their dependency on powerful nations, whichever they might be, whether it's the United States, the United Kingdom, Russia, China, whichever imperialist power they're subject to, they could suddenly say, actually, we don't need you anymore to feed us because we can feed ourselves. And that radically alters power relations. Yeah. And I've, I've heard people ask you the question, you know, how do you ensure that the perverse corporate influences that control markets now don't get their hands on this new technology and have the same kind of perverse effects. And I've heard you say, well, we've got to keep antitrust strong and intellectual property weak. Yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, and that's the same across every single market you can imagine. You know, whether you're talking about Amazon, you're talking about Google, you're talking about any any business sector, it's gone completely the wrong way. You know? But again, that's politics. And you know, we've allowed this to happen as citizens. You know, we have not been active enough in ensuring that um, our governments protect us from predatory corporate behavior. And as a result, the corporations have become more and more powerful. The people who own the corporations, the oligarchs, have become more and more powerful. And we're now subject to their every whim. But we can take that back. You know, as David Graeber pointed out um, before he died, you know, we, you know, we made these systems. We can change these systems. They're all human-made systems. And if we don't change these systems, we're toast. You know, there's no way we're going to get through this century without a radical change. This isn't a luxury. You know, this isn't something that would be nice to have. Let's have a, let's have a happier world. Let's have a world. You know, let's have a planet. Let's have a habitable planet. That's what we're talking about. Because without that radical change, we will not have a habitable planet. And all our dreams, all our nightmares, all our hopes, all our fears, everything we wish for, everything we imagine for ourselves, good or bad, become completely irrelevant because there will be nothing. Yeah, well, look, I, I really obviously hope that everyone heeds your warning and especially reads your books, which I think are offer some specificity in which I at least find comfort can you tell our audience where they can find your books and continue to follow you, um, your speaking events, any of your other writings online? 
Thank you. Um, well, I've got a website called uh, monbio.com. Um, uh, I, I write for The Guardian newspaper here, here in the UK. Um, and uh, my latest book is called Regenesis, Feeding the World Without Devouring the Planet. And I think it's, yeah, it's coming out in the US this month. It's probably coming out right now. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Well, I know that I'm looking forward to reading it. Um, and I appreciate you being so generous with your time here today. Thank you so much, Brianna. It's, re it's a real delight to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. And to all our listeners, you know, this is a podcast that comes out twice a week. You're listening to a Thursday episode, but if you want more content, you can subscribe at patreon.com slash bad faith podcast for $5 a month and get um, premium episodes as well as access to our full back catalog, which is pretty substantive at this point. Thank you as always for listening and take care of yourselves and keep the faith. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash bad faith podcast. That's patreon.com slash bad faith podcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.